I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, and I'm going to uh, tonight ask you to open your Bibles up to Genesis chapter 22, and what I want to do over the next couple of days, the missions conference, is really deal with some, some basic issues of, of what, uh, you know, what it takes for us to really be his hands and his feet. Um, what has happened over the years is that we have unfortunately um, made evangelism to where it is a choice and, and not a command of Scripture. And the Bible teaches that it's a command. If I were to ask you to define sin for me, could you properly define sin as missing the mark? Yes. What is sin? It's breaking God's law. If you broke if you disobeyed a direct command of God, would that not be sin? I think so. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you will be my witnesses. The word there is used 38 times in the book of Acts. And it is an understanding for us of who we're supposed to be. If you look at Acts chapter 2, you find that it says that they went house to house. Who's the they? It's talking to, about all the believers, not just the pastor, not just the staff. In fact, they didn't just have that. All of the believers went house to house to house to house. It is expected that they all would do that. Someone at Southwestern Seminary a couple of years ago did a study, um, and it's, it really is not much of a study. It's just a mathematical thing if you really look at it. You ask the question, if we have 7 billion people in the world, if you did the process of natural multiplication, how long would it take to reach the whole world? Well, that would mean if, if I see someone come to Christ and then us two become four, and four becomes eight, and eight becomes 16, 32, 64, and so on. They figured it up, and you can do the own figuring yourself. It takes about five to six months. Guys, I, I, we've been driving around your community all day long. You know, you, you've got all kinds of places here where churches used to be. Let's just be honest. That's not just in New Hampshire. That's all of the United States. I knew of a a church in, in um, uh, Arkansas that their old church building became a fur factory. I, you know, I don't know if you, you ever watch uh, the show, um, watch anything on, on um, uh, what, what is it, the, the, uh, where they build stuff. It's, anyway, uh, the home, 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 show, home channel, what is that called? HGTV, yeah, that goofy thing, yeah. That, that thing, yeah, my yeah, I know. I've, I've spent too many nights watching that. Anyway, HGTV used to have a show back in the back in the early part of 2000s where they would show odd houses across America. I don't know if you ever saw that. And, and it was odd that almost every show, they'd have two or three of those were old church buildings where people would buy them all across the Midwest, all across the United States. I just finished a class on spiritual awakenings for a PhD class at Southwestern, I mean, excuse me, at Liberty. And, you know, when you go all over New Hampshire, all over Vermont, all over the Northeast, most of those, those early, you know, re, uh, revivalists were up in these areas. You know, and, and the sad part about that is you can go with any, you can go in several places within two hours of Boston and be in, what will be classified as totally um, unchurched people groups, just like you would find. I mean, come on, guys. We're in a place now where most of Brazil is more evangelized than almost any place in America. You realize we're the third most missionized nation in the world, which means most nations send more missionaries to us now than we do to them. Let me just say this to you. If all we're going to do is pass down another generation of what it means to go to church without understanding what it means to be the church and take the gospel out, then all of us might as well just shut down the buildings and go home because it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. It's the truth. The only thing, the only help for our nation is the gospel. That's it. The only help for our nation is the gospel. Because, you know, we can fight over politics, but it isn't going to matter who's in the White House if the gospel's not reigning in our country. And you can blame all kinds of people for that, but if you want to know the truth, then we all need to go home and look in the mirror. I mean, seriously, I, I was interim pastor of church a while back. I walked in with the deacons, 
I said, I would not ordain a deacon. It, you know, I was just talking about it. I said, I would ask him the question. Tell me the last time you shared your faith. Tell me the last person you led to Christ. If you could not explain that or answer that, then I wouldn't ordain you. Because why would we put someone in leadership to only propagate an attitude that's not going to help the church grow? Seriously. All we're going to do is multiply what we're not doing. And I, you know what's funny? The chairman of the deacons looked at me and he says, well, David, if that had been the rule when we were ordained, none of us here would be ordained. Come on, let's be honest. If we were to go around right now and say tonight, how many of us this week have shared the gospel with someone outside the pulpit, outside the church? I'm not talking about inviting them to church. That's not evangelism. I'm talking about share Jesus Christ with them. I actually told someone about Christ. You can say, well, you don't know what it's like to be in the Northeast. Guys, I lived in Indiana and Ohio. I, I, I know exactly what it's like. There's plenty of places in northern Ohio, northern Indiana that are they're very unreached. I've been, in, I've been all over the world doing this. And I can just tell you that you can, you can use that excuse all you want, and that's all it is, an excuse. It is. The people in New Hampshire need the gospel just as bad as people in Georgia or Florida. It really don't matter, does it? Well, they'll listen more down there. No, they won't. Guys, I would rather go to where the, where the, the garden has never been tilled than I had go to a place where they've, they've worn out the soil so bad it won't grow anymore. And that's what it's like over much of the South. People have been so churchized for years. And by the way, it's not that way anymore. If you go over much of that, it's just not that way. You've got plenty of places all over the southern part of the United States. There is no Bible Belt anymore, period. So there is no excuse. The only excuse we have is that we've been disobedient with the gospel. Let's just be honest there. Let's be honest. I mean, come on. You say, well, you're being harsh. No, I'm not. I'm not being harsh. I'm just being honest with you. It is the truth. If we are not sharing the gospel with people, they will not get saved. The only thing God cannot use is our silence. Period. Period. It's just the way it is. I mean, come on. Is there anything there to argue with? There really isn't, is there? From a biblical standpoint, there's not. The early church was expected to take the gospel into the world. It's exactly what they did. They took the gospel in the world verbally, personally, person to person, face to face. They took the gospel into the world. We've built systems now to where we have programs. We invite them to a building. We do all this. It's almost like we're trying to sneak up on them. But, but guys, there is no sneaking up. You know, I mean, in, in all of our sneaking up, what's happened to the church? Come on, let's be honest. If it was working, then I wouldn't be standing here telling you to stop it. But it's not working, is it? How can we expect people to get saved when they don't know about Jesus? And when we sit in the same room with them years after year after year at work or wherever we are, we never tell never them about Christ, how can we expect them to get saved? That is absolutely the most chicken fried stupid statement in the whole, there ever has ever been. It's the truth. To think about that. My, my, my best friend, growing up, this guy named Ray McPherson, Ray's dad. Ray texted me a couple years ago. His dad got saved at 72 years old. We've been praying for Daddy Mac for 35 years. Okay? 35 years for him to get saved. He had made a million dollars and lost it probably four times. He would, he would make it and drink it away and party it away and smoke it away and whatever he, a way he could do it, he would, he would lose it. That's what he did over and over again. What happened was his, his uh, son-in-law got cancer. When he was on his deathbed, he would sit there with him for hours. His son-in-law had surrendered his life to Christ. He would share with him. And one afternoon, he, just, he told Jimmy, he said, Jimmy, you keep trying to fill your life full of stuff, and I'm telling you what you need is Jesus. And he went through and explained to him exactly what he needed to do to enter into a relationship with Christ. You know what Jimmy did? He surrendered his life to Christ. His brother, I mean, excuse me, his, his my, my uh, friend, Raymond, he's, he talked to his dad, and we were 
celebrating about this. And the next day, Raymond went to the altar of his church. He got on his face and, and prayed and asked God to forgive him because he'd stopped praying for his dad. And he, he finally got curious. He called his dad one day and said, Dad, he says, I just got to ask you a question. He says, you're 72 years old. Why did it take you so long? Listen to what his dad said. His dad said, son, no one ever told me how. Guys, how do we expect people to get saved? Don't complain about that kid across the street who's shooting up heroin, doing everything else in the world, if you're not going to give him what he really needs, which is the gospel. We believe the gospel's powerful enough to heal anyone, don't we? That's why we believe in prison ministries, right? It's exactly it. I got a real good friend who, who has, who's had a ministry for years at one of the largest prisons in the United States down in, in Louisiana. I mean, they have, a, they have a training school, and they've had it for years using, experiencing God in the prisons, and, and, and it's been phenomenal what's happened. We were in Wisconsin a few years ago, and a buddy of mine was pastoring, and we were preparing to do a block party in his community and to do some training for all of his folks. So you know what they did? They took the roughest part of their community, and for two solid weeks, they prayer walked that community every day, asking God to break down spiritual walls of that community to open up doors for the gospel. Do you know what? He got a, he got a, the pastor got a phone call from the mayor and the council asking him to come visit them. And they, and they brought the police chief and all these guys in there, and they said, we want to know what you did. They said, what do you mean? So that is the, the most crime-ridden area of our whole community. And for that block, those two or three blocks that you prayed over, the most crime-ridden area, there wasn't one call to the police department in the two weeks you were there. What happened? What happened? They went in, and they saturated that community. They were walking them down the streets. They were sharing the gospel with people. They were talking about Jesus. And God had a chance to move in those people's lives. God, God cannot move in those people's lives unless we are out there telling them about that. Well, people aren't going to listen to you. Well, you know what? If they don't have anything to listen, at least, I mean, you've got to at least give them a chance to say no. So let's just be honest with this. I can, I can give you stuff, guys, to help do this kind of stuff. I've been training, doing this for 36 years. I've been in ministry. I love doing this. I love getting to do this. And I can give you a lot of reasons why and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, my students at Liberty are leading more people to Christ right now than we, I've ever seen. I've got one student who this semester alone, it's, he, he had only shared the gospel one time. He's an 18-year-old young man. One time in his whole life until this semester, he came up to me the other day and he says, you know what? You ask us to pr pray for five people, four of those people are my best friends, and I've led all four of them to Christ this semester. Because if you don't share, how are they going to know? Don't have God talks. They don't need God talks. Because they don't even know who God is. They need Jesus talks. And when you share your testimony, they don't need, they need to hear your Jesus story. Not your emotional, when my mom and dad brought me to church story, and all this kind of stuff. I make my students do their testimony and they can't use church or mom or dad or nothing. It has to be, this is what happened when I was eight years old and I realized I was a sinner and I need to repent of my sin. And so I confess Christ as my personal Savior. This is what took place in my life based upon the fact of me facing my, the fact that I am a sinner in Jesus Christ. Not that I wa walked down some aisle or I prayed some prayer or I did anything like that. When I was an eight-year-old kid at vacation Bible school because mom and dad had been church all the time. We went to church, church, church. Church don't save anybody. Jesus does. You understand what I'm saying? So what I want to do tonight, starting tonight, just I'm going to take about 30 minutes tonight with this. And then what I'd like for us to do is tomorrow morning, I know at 1130, I think we're having a, a time to get for some training and stuff like that. And I hope all of you will be there and, and, and a bunch more as well. And what we're going to talk about tonight is building a culture of yes. And then tomorrow night, I'm going to, I'm going to go to Acts and we're going to walk through that and kind of build up on what we're going to do tomorrow morning. We're going to talk about three V's tomorrow morning. What it means to be vulnerable, what it means to be visual, what it means to be verbal. The three V's of how you share your faith. You have to be vulnerable, visual, verbal. Trust me. Vulnerable, visual, verbal. All right, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. And then Sunday morning, I want to talk to you about something that uh, I've taught Justin and these guys in the past, which is servant evangelism. We're going to talk about how do you build that Jesus culture 
into every single thing that you do. Servant evangelism is not doing nice stuff. It's not random acts of kindness. It is us being very intentional in everything we do to take the gospel back out. Guys, we don't need more evangelism programs. You don't need an evangelism program. What you need is to take to make yourself the program and take the gospel back to your own community, the people you know. If we went around right now and I would ask you, how many people do you know that you've never had a, com- a spiritual conversation with because you do not know their spiritual condition? I'm not talking about them going to church. How many people do you know right now that you've never had a spiritual conversation with that you're not sure of their, sp- their salvation? I mean, I bet you if we went around the crowd tonight, we could do that the rest of the night. We'd probably come up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of names. It's not because those people aren't in your life. It's not because they're not in this community. They're all over this community. It's because we do not recognize what it means. We're trying to soft sell the gospel. Now, that doesn't mean we have to scream and holler and yell at them. But what we need to do is tell people why they need Christ. You know, I saw... Uh, one of the restaurants today, a, a, a thing says coexist on the back. You've seen that. It has the cross and all this kind of things. It's, it's a silly thing because Christianity, what makes Christianity different than any other world religion? It's the story of the cross. Do you realize Islam does not have a path to salvation? Hinduism does not have a path to salvation. Confucianism doesn't have a path to salvation. The New, Te- New Age movement doesn't have a path to salvation. None of them deal with the issue of sin that we're separated from God well, Christianity really speaks in terms of that from the standpoint that we are separated from God and that only and if we broke his law, we missed the mark on his law, then only then God should be the only one who can really bring us to that place where he can build the road where he can say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. We need to know why Jesus resurrected. For instance, I asked my class a while back, I said, Why did Jesus die? I was sitting on the plane the other day with a lady who's a spirit guy. That's what she could say. I said, ma'am. Give me your, uh, tell, me, tell me about yourself. I said, uh, you know, what, what kind of spiritual beliefs do you have? She said, well, I'm so glad you asked. I said, really? What kind of spiritual beliefs do you have? She said, I'm a spirit guide. I help lead people across the great river so they can connect with their ancestors and know about this. I'm going, I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be good. Well, I said, well, tell me all about it. She did. I said, well, do you mind if I tell you what I, what, what I am? She said, no, I'd love to hear it. I said, well, I'm a Christian. She said, well, I am too. I said, really? So you believe Jesus lived, died, and rose again? She said, absolutely. And then we were talking about sin and stuff like that, and, you know, and, and everything. And she told me she didn't believe much in sin. You know, that's negative energy. You know, she'd been talking to Joe Olstein for a while, I guess. But, but anyway, she just says negative stuff. And so I looked at her, and I asked her, I said, well, ma'am, why do you think Jesus died? She said, as an example for us. I said, no, ma'am, that's kind of radical. He didn't have to have an example for us. Why do you think he died? The Bible says he, he physically died, and he stayed dead for three days because that culture had to be dead for three days to be declared dead. Tell me why he died. And she, she couldn't answer it. I said, let me tell you why he died. He died because he took our sin upon himself, because we sinned, not because he sinned. I said, the ultimate end of all sin is death. That's why sin is so serious. You have to understand, unless a person knows that they're dying of sin, they're not going to want the life of Jesus. They need to understand that. And we walk through this whole process with her and that kind of thing. But guys, we have got to be, we do not have to be obnoxious. We can be loving. We've got to pull out the towel and wash people's feet as much as we possibly can. We need to exemplify who Christ is. Paul put it this way. He says, you need to not only give them the gospel, but give them your life. First Thessalonians chapter 2. So what I want us to do is talk through this just real quickly. Just walk through what it means to build a culture of yes. Genesis chapter 22, real familiar story. You've heard it before. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and there offer him up as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and sat up his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, you stay here with the donkey. And the young man and I will go up there and we will worship. By the way, isn't that interesting? He helped write a book a couple years ago called Great Commission to Worship. The heartbeat of worship has nothing to do with music. The heartbeat of worship has everything to do with obedience. 
He did not have a guitar. And if he had had a keyboard, he didn't have a place to plug it in up there, right? Bottom line is it has nothing to do with music. Music can be an expression of worship as long as the heart is obedient. But if we're doing this all the time and our hearts are far from God, we're just doing calisthenics. We're just getting sweaty. It's the truth. I don't mind if you jump up and down, jump over pews, grab all the ceiling fan and go around in circles, guys. It don't matter to me. I don't care. But as long as your heart's right. As long as you're obedient to the things of God. He said he's going to go up there and worship. We're going to come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and the knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac said to, uh, to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. And the two of them went together. Then they came to the place which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there, as he had done thousands of times. And there, there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand. He took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God. By the way, that's a, that's a word. I think one of the reasons why we are, we are, our churches are dying so much is because we don't talk about fear anymore. Look at how many times the Bible mentions fear. And it's not talking about disrespect. It's talking about shaking in your boots. Guys, we, we have this concept, this idea that when we go to heaven one day, we're just going to walk up to the throne and say, hey, hey, homeboy, good to see you, God. He's just going to slap her. No, it ain't going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen. Read, read Revelation 5. John laid down before the throne and wept because he was in the presence of holiness, holiness like he had never experienced in his whole life. You need to understand, guys, I mean, the greatest thing about heaven is God, not us. It's, it's, it's him. It's Christ. So we need to understand that. You know, and, and he, he said, then Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and there, you know, uh, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket. And the Bible tells us, until this day, that, that place is called the Lord will provide. You know, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. So I wanna, what I want to do is I want to just consider two really important questions here. And, and I'll explain to you why these two questions are such a big deal to me in just a moment here. First question is simply, why would God require such a price? And number two, number two is, how could Abraham actually do it? Why would God require such a price, and how could Abraham actually do it? Those, I think those are good questions to ask, don't you think? You know, why would God require such a price? It just seems awful extreme, right? And, and, if, it's, and if, if God did require such a price, how in the world could Abraham actually bring himself to doing that? Well, let's talk about that. And, and for me to explain to you my understanding of this, I have to explain this. This is a picture of me and my little brother, Kevin. It's him on the left side there. And, and that's, that's me when I'm about three years old. Y'all can go all if you want to or owe me. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> my, uh, that's the last picture I ever had made with my little brother. Um, and what happened was this. Several years ago, that, that picture was in my office. Several years ago, I was... Uh, I was back in 1986, Christmas, we were back home. I was still at Southwestern Seminary at that time, and we'd come back home and was visiting family. And, and we were standing in our hallway. In our hallway, we had pictures of all of us kids, me and my brother and my sister and Kevin, and all of us about the same age. I have this little gangster outfit on when I'm a little kid and everything. Anyway, we're standing right in front of Kevin's picture. And I, for the first time in my life, I asked my mom, Mom, what happened to Kevin? So my mom, for the first time, actually tells me. Takes us back to 1963, Christmas time, you know. It's kind of interesting because I always thought my mom and dad were kind of sadistic. I mean, you think about this. When I was growing up, you didn't have the Internet. So we, we, every year we would get a Sears and Roebuck catalog, a J.C. Penney catalog, and the greatest catalog of all was the ser service merchandise catalog. And you would look through that because they had more toys than any of them, and you would cut pictures out of those toys, and you'd stick them on a piece of paper and slide them under mom and dad's door. Did you do that? We did that all the time, you know. And so you'd wait for six months to get what was on that picture, and you'd, open, you'd barely open it up, and Mom and Dad would walk in and say, hey, get ready, we're going to Grandma and Grandpa's. Wait a minute, I just got a new bike. Forget Grandma and Grandpa. They can just mail us our presents or whatever, you know. And, you know, 30 minutes later, we would be heading to Grandma and Grandpa's, and, I, and they'd let us I'd take a little Tonka truck with me or something. But anyway, we, you know, next day we came back, and Mom said we played really late. My mom and dad helped my, helped my sister put together the most um, 
the most satanic thing ever created, a Barbie RV. If you've never put one of those together, you've never lived. And if, you're, if, if, if you know of anybody, who, if, you, if your family ever put one together for you, you should thank them <laughs> big time. It's got little pieces. If you can put a Barbie RV together and never cuss, you're better than me. I had to repent over and over and over again. I had to do it twice, okay? Anyway, they, uh, uh, um, mom said we played about 11 o'clock, 11.30, went to bed. Got up the next morning. Mom said that she just didn't sleep well and she knew something was wrong. She said about 5 o'clock, she got out of bed, walked down the end of it. My little brother Kevin was laying in there. She went to pick him up, and she noticed his lips were turning blue. She put him back in really quickly. She screamed at my dad to get, get up and get ready. My dad gets up, puts his clothes on, you know, and, and puts his coat on, his house shoes, and runs outside and gets the car ready. There's six inches of snow in East Tennessee. You know, mom runs in the bathroom, puts her, you know, house coat and her coat on, shoes. And mom said when she come back in to pick up Kevin, he started gurgling. She picked him up, he opened his eyes, and then just went limp in her arms. The only thing I remember about that morning was opening up the door as my mom was running by. My mom said, go back to bed. My brother and sister weren't so fortunate. They, they saw Kevin's eyes rolling back in his head. They saw all that. It impacted them greatly. Anyway, we, um, my mom and dad went to the hospital, took off the hospital there in East Tennessee, in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And when they got there, the, guy, the doctor who was on duty that morning Happened to be the same doctor that brought me and my brothers and my sister in the world. Mom said she laid Kevin out in his arms. They went back and worked on him a while. He get this picture of this couple in their late 20s standing there in a waiting room in their pajamas, basically. You know, and the doctor opens up the door, walks back towards my mom. She says he got closer. She could tell he'd been crying. And he simply just says, look, I'm sorry, John, we need it, but Kevin's gone. Guys, it impacted our life hugely. We slept across the same bed, me and my brother and sister, with mom and dad on both ends, for months. You know, mom was scared to let us go back to our rooms. She was scared something else would happen. You know, and it, every day, every year on the 27th day of December, we would find my mom back in a room somewhere crying. So, you know, this went for years and years and years. So when I read this story, and got old enough to begin to comprehend it, I've always asked those questions. Why would God require such a thing from Abraham? And if he did, which he did according to Scripture, how could Abraham actually do it? So let's talk about it. Basically, according to what the Bible tells us, God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to take your son, Isaac, I want you to offer him up for me. And the Bible tells us he never complains, he never gripes. He just does it. Gets up the next morning, gets everything he needs. They take up, take to get, take off on a three day journey. He's got some of his young men to help him and everything. Now, I personally believe that Abraham didn't sleep much for three days. Because if I knew I only had my child for three more days, I would want to spend every moment with him. And as a parent, you would remember everything about your child, right? The first time they walked, the first time they talked. The first time they called you daddy or mama. You know, the first time they prayed with them. Like, I, I would never forget the day that I, I baptized my girls. You know, my father, my, uh, uh, my, da- my oldest daughter, the reason why I know she, I found out she could walk was because my wife was coming home from work and, and I, was, I came in and I was worn out. And I, I sat in the chair and like a lot of us guys, I fell asleep for a moment, a brief moment. Because my, when my wife turned around, she saw Dana. She's about eight, nine months old. And she's just, she st- stumbles up and starts walking across the floor. My wife is so enamored watching her walk across the floor, she never told me that Dana came over there and grabbed her the end of my easy chair where my feet were. Next thing I felt was a warm something on my foot, and it bit me. And it was my, my daughter. It woke me up, you know. And anyway, you know, my youngest daughter has mild cerebral palsy. Kara was a 26-week baby and phenomenal kid, phenomenal kid. And she, she uh, 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 I mean, we celebrated everything with her. In fact, I, when she first walked, when she finally could walk, with, 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 she had leg braces, but she didn't have a walker. She would just kind of stumble. And we took her to Chili's in Indianapolis, Indiana, to go celebrate. We were coming out of Chili's. And as we were walking out, I opened one door. My other daughter opened another one. Debbie walks out of the car. 
And this couple stands there, and they're staring at Kara's just coming out the door. And the moment we drop, we let the doors go back. I walked over that couple. Dana went out the car, and I says, I am so sorry. I told her she didn't get away from the bar. This is exactly what was going to happen. And I walked out of the car. Why? Because you're not supposed to stare. All right? But anyway, you don't forget those things. I can guarantee you why Abraham was looking at Isaac, he was remembering every little thing about him. Because that's what parents do, right? And then the Bible says that they come to the place where God says, this is it. So what does Abraham do? He doesn't question God. He simply gets everything out he needs. And he and Isaac take off up the mountain. And that's when they stop and say, we're going to go worship. In other words, we're going to give back to God our full obedience. And they keep walking. Then Isaac looks at his dad and he says, dad, he says, you know, you got the fire and the wood and everything else, but where's the lamb? What does he say? He gives a great prophetic statement, one that's fulfilled that day. It's fulfilled several thousand years later. He says what? He says, don't worry, for God will provide for himself the lamb, of which he did that day, and he provided Jesus, you know, thousands of years later, right? Then they come to the place where they're, you know, exactly where God says this is it. So Abraham begins to build the altar over here. And I just like to imagine for a moment, most commentators believe Isaac was probably 12. I believe that's probably correct. Some of them believe he was as old as 20. You know, either way, I want, you, I want you to think about this. He was big enough, fast enough, and strong enough that once he realized what his daddy was going to do, he could have easily ran back down that mountain and, and go and found his mom and said, Mom and Daddy's crazy, right? He didn't do that. He trusted his Heavenly Father as he trusted his own dad and vice versa. I can just imagine for a moment that you got... Isaac walking around looking for that lamb that his dad said would be there. And then he hears his dad say, son, come here. Walks over to him. As it would have been the tradition, he ties his hands. Because they would tie an animal, his hand and feet, before they would sacrifice it. At that moment, he probably knew. He, if he didn't, he certainly knew when he tied his feet. Now, I want you to think about this. How did Isaac get on the altar? I mean... You know, Abraham was a 100-plus-year-old man. Look, I'm 55, and my back's really bad. I mean, I can't imagine being 100-plus years old and doing that, but I, I got to believe that Isaac probably helped his dad get himself on the altar. As his, he was lifting him, he was kind of scrunching up too, and it was kind of a mutual thing going on there that, okay, I'm going to do this. And then the Bible tells us he took the knife, and he was ready to slice his neck, which would have been the tradition, to slice the neck and let the, bleed, the animal bleed out. And, you know, we don't know if he was crying, if he was shaking, what was going on. But we could just imagine the emotions, everything going on. I mean, he waited all his life for Isaac. And then all of a sudden, the angel intervenes and says, Abraham, Abraham, he says, don't lay a hand on the lad, for I know that you fear God. I ask my students this all the time. Do you fear God more than you fear your friends? How about this? Do you fear God more than you fear your neighbors? Do you fear your family members? Do you fear God more than anyone else? Because if you do, then you won't be scared of the gospel. Guys, we want a church of our own making that doesn't require anything that makes us feel uncomfortable. Show me that in the New Testament. Paul wrote much of the New Testament sitting in a jail cell. Come on. There's no place that says, come on, follow me and I will make you comfortable. All of you will drive Cadillacs. You'll have the nicest chariots. No, Paul gave all that up to follow Christ. Total opposite. Let's think about that. And then God intervenes and, and I got to believe on that mountain they had a just a charismatic fit there because, because that which was dead was now alive, that which was taken was now given back, and he unties him, and they just grab hold of each other, and just amazing what takes place. Now, I want you to get this here for a moment, okay? Why would I share this story with you at the beginning of a missions conference? Why? Well, I mean, first of all, I want you to notice that Abraham and Isaac's life magnified much more after this. I mean, if you look at Scripture, it was after Job obeyed God that 
God took his life and magnified it more. 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time he will exalt you. God will only exalt us when we trust him enough to follow him and will not compete with him over the allegiance of our lives. We will simply be obedient because that's he knows best and we will surrender to that. i got to believe the biggest hurdle we have to the gospel is our attitude of yes. So I want you to think about that for a moment. Abraham never questioned God. Isaac didn't either. So it's obvious. How do we answer these questions? Think about, you know, why would God require such a price? Because God requires submission more than commitment. It's not just commitment of the head, it's submission of the soul, the heart, the being. Why would God require such a price? I mean, think about it. Abraham's a good dad. He would have gladly climbed up on that altar and taken his own life to save Isaac's, wouldn't he? Any parent would do that, right? But that's not what God required. Why? Because what God wanted was the deepest, most valuable thing that, Isaac, that Abraham had. And obviously, Isaac was the promise. So what he's saying to him was, I'll, I'll know that you love me if you're willing to give that up. In some of our cases, it's simply our fear. Others of it, it's graven images and idols we've placed in our lives. Religion has replaced relationship. All those things. But the ultimate answer is submission. Why would God require such a price? Because submission. Guys, there's two kinds of faith in Scripture, one that leads to God, one that doesn't. A faith of admission does not save us, but our culture thinks it does. You admit there's a God, you do well, the Bible says, but so does Satan, he trembles. In our culture, well, I believe in God, well, big deal. Define who God is. And that is a big deal, by the way. You see, the faith of submission is what saves us. It's when we surrender under him. How about this? God also requires full obedience more than religious duty. Why, how in the world could Abraham actually do it? Let me tell you why. Because the ultimate act of worship was obedience, and Abraham never had a choice. Oh, yes, he did. No, he didn't. Disobedience is a never a valid choice of a child of God. If we are his children, we should obey, right? Yes or no? What does the New Testament say? It says, if you love him, you will do what? Disobey his commandments, right? I'll keep his commandments. Why would Abraham do it? Because to not do so would mean that he would be disobeying his heavenly father. It's as if we've normalized disobedience and tried to bring God down to our level than letting God bring us to his level and realize it's through full obedience that he will magnify himself and bless his people. Ultimately, that is it. You see, the bottom line is God requires our yes in order to be a Christ follower. Now, I want to expound upon that for a moment, and then we'll close. Just real quick, just think about this. All right? Several years ago, I was at Southwestern Seminary, and my wife had been, got really sick in 1989. She's she has a disease called Wegener. She's been on, on and off chemo for years. She almost died in 1989. She gave birth to our youngest daughter in a bedpan in Harris Hospital in Fort Worth, Texas at 26 weeks, 15, 14 inches long. Little, barely lived. Kara graduated from Liberty two years ago with honors. I mean, graduated from high school with honors and graduated from Liberty two years ago and was recognized as one of three kids who graduated from Liberty that year that Jerry recognized. Amazing kid. She's four foot eleven, weighs about, about ninety five pounds. She's already been to the Philippines working with families, handicapped children, still has a speech impediment, still can't drive because of cerebral palsy. She can walk, do all those things. But anyway, here's 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 what happened. I, this was about two years after Kara was born, about a year and a half. About two years, because Kara had her first seizure, I think. And I remember standing there in front of Burkina Faso, West Africa. We, Debbie and I had spent time there after we graduated college. We wanted to go back and be missionaries to, 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 to Africa. But, but once Debbie got sick and once Kara started having seizures and all these things, there was no way any missions organization anywhere 
was going to appoint us. I remember that day, standing there in that missions room, and by myself, chapel had already started, and I am screaming at the top of my lungs to God. I'm mad at him. You ever done that before? I'm screaming, God, why would you let this happen? I can handle all the other stuff, but you took away my call. Why did you take away my call? And I was so angry. We, cause, and I remember I just stormed out the side door. I went down toward the rotunda areas at Southwestern. You could hear your voice, you know, kind of echo. And I heard chapel was on. For some reason, I went upstairs in chapel. I'd never, I didn't do that very often. That day, I was the only guy, the only person in chapel in the balcony. I was sitting up here by myself. And they introduced the, new, the speaker for that day. And God has a great sense of humor because guess who the speaker was? He was the vice president of the Foreign Mission Board. He was begging people to go overseas. And I'm standing up in the chapel, in the balcony, even angrier, going, I've already said I want to go overseas. And God, I've already told God I'll do that. And look what he allowed happened to me. You know, I'm just ticked off to no end. At the very end of the service, the, the guy steps out on the end, kind of in front of the pulpit like this. He says, I want you to go home tonight. Go back to your dorm. Go back to your apartment, your house, wherever it is. And I want you to take one sheet of paper. I want you to write one word on it. I want you to lay it on the ground. I want you to lay on top of it for as long as it takes before, before that one word explains your relationship with Christ. In other words, it becomes your, your definition of who you are in faith. And the word is yes. Yes before God asks. Yes when it don't make sense. Regardless of what it might be tomorrow, today, the next day, the answer is yes. Yes, God, I'll go across the street and share with my neighbor, even though he's cussed me out 12 times before. Yes, Lord, I'll do this. God, you know what? I'm willing to be humiliated for you if that's what it takes, God, because maybe one person might come to Christ. Or whatever it takes, the answer is yes. Now, what happened was I went home at night, and Debbie and I had been dealing with some stuff, and a friend of mine had asked me to turn in my res resume to go to Indiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, to be the management director for the Indiana Baptist Convention, and I didn't want to do it, because so I didn't want to go to Indiana. It was cold in Indiana. It was warm in Texas, all this kind of stuff, you know, things. So that night, we just got down before the Lord, and it was like, we said yes. But then I pulled a fast one. Okay, God, if you're serious about this, then bring somebody to us who can tell us all about Indiana. I'm serious. <laughs> we were out in the middle of nowhere in North Texas. I'm not kidding. I mean nowhere in North Texas. And someone knocks at the door about two nights later. I open up the door, and I kid you not, Debbie and I are both looking at this. I can still remember where I opened the door. And it was a young lady selling Southwestern books. And she had an Indiana University shirt on. I'm not exaggerating. She sat in our house for three hours, answered every question we had. When she left, I said, Debbie, I don't know when, but get ready. We're going to Indiana. Five months later, they called me unanimously to go. Six, six and a half months later, we were in Indiana. And guess what? The first week we were there, it snowed a foot. So much so, my oldest daughter stood at the front door and says, Daddy, Mama, what is it? It's snow. She said, does it ever go away? We found out pretty soon it don't go away till May, right? Yeah. In fact, our youngest daughter, when we had that first snow, we set her out in the snow, and it was so tall, we couldn't see her. The snow was over her, you know, in it. And, um, but we absolutely loved Indiana. We'd have never been there had we not said yes. That yes brought me back to Southwestern, brought me to Ohio, and brought me to Liberty. There's no way I could have ever done that. We could have never done that had we not said yes. You see, the reason why most of us never share our faith is because we're still in the maybe stage with God. When I get around to it, possibly, when I can afford it. It's like a church saying, we'll start planting churches when we get up to 400. Really? If you can't plant churches at 40, you won't plant them at 400. It's the truth. 
Well, I'll start sharing my faith when I get out of seminary. If you're not sharing your faith in seminary, these guys will tell you that I will tell them what you're not doing now, you won't do then. If you're going halfway across the world to share your faith with people you won't share with across the street, stop going halfway across the world. It started here. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the utmost parts of the earth means all at the same time. Not one at a time. Bottom line here, if you are serious and you flew me up here for, all the, for these days to talk to you as a church and try to help you work through some of this stuff, you've got a great pastor. You didn't need me here. But if we're going to make a difference with this, it starts when God's people, honestly and truthfully, whether you're 7 or 70, say yes and mean it. Stop pulling it off the altar and leave it there. And let God have it forever. But it scares me. Who cares? Do you think it didn't scare Abraham when he's marching up that mountain? Guys, it has nothing to do with fear or gifts or anything. It has everything to do with obedience. We've got the gospel. we got what we need. He's changed our lives, right? What's to say he can't change others? Right? I had a man two years ago before I moved, moved to Lynchburg. He came up to me. He was in Ohio. Walked up to me. He's an older man. He's in the mid-70s. He said, David, I heard you're moving to Lynchburg, going to Liberty. I said, yeah. He said, he took out his billfold and he pulled out an old card like this, it was all wrinkled up and everything, and faded out pencil. And he pulled it out and he says, you remember when I did this at church? It had, had a yes you could barely see. Said, yeah. He said, let me tell you what happened. <laughs> he said, I said yes that night because everybody else I thought said yes. And he said, I wasn't really sure about that yes until the next day when I was asked to take disaster relief training. He said, so I did. I thought, okay, that's a good beginning point. That's a safe place to start. Until they asked me to lead a group, and I couldn't say no because I'd already said yes, so I had to say yes. Then they asked me to be one of the directors of it. I couldn't say no because I already said yes, so I had to say yes there too. So he says, let me just tell you five years later that every time I get a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's been some disaster somewhere across America, and I've got to get my team together, and I'm driving down to southern Ohio, out of the state, and I'm worn out, and I'm tired, and I'm, every, I'm grumpy. I'm cussing you all the way down there. He said, but three weeks later, when I come back home and hundreds of people have come to Christ, and I got to be a part of that, I thank God every day that I said, yes, I just only regret I have is I wish I would have done it earlier. I'm just telling you, guys. As long as you're messing around with a maybe or when I can or when I got time, you'll never have time. You'll never have enough money. You'll never have enough opportunities. You'll never have anything until you fully say yes.